Yes, the world thinks certain things and they see certain things, but they don't see what's actually happened behind the scenes. So dear viewers and listeners, I am back with another episode of Side by Side with Kazi Shafiqur Rahman. You know, you forget about everything. You forget about everything that you're, you could be creative, you could be something, you could make something out of your life. Today, it's not going to be side by side. I think it's going to be me talking about my journey with uh, my aviation company, Firnas, the questions that I often get asked on social media or when I meet someone. I was like broke from Firnas, like, you know, it took every single penny out of me. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to my friend to fire away with, with some questions. What is Firnas? A lot of people don't know what Firnas is, or well, if they do, Let's explain to them what Firnas so is. So Firnas, uh, from a naming point of view, um, is named after a uh, gentleman by the name of Abbas ibn Firnas, who was an 8th century um, Muslim inventor, astronomer, scientist, who happened to be the first man to also f um, conduct human flight. So he took off from a cliff in Cordoba, in, in Spain and um, he, he jumped from the cliff and he glided across and although, although he broke a few bones um, before he landed or while he landed but I, I consider him to be the first man to ever um, think of flying or, or even complete any form of um, flying um, way before the Da Vinci and the Wright brothers obviously the Wright brothers have invented the engine flight whilst Abbas ibn Firnas was the first man to actually conduct human flight. So that's from a naming point of view. We wanted to honor uh, a Muslim scientist and astronomer uh, uh, to, to, you know, to promote the history of, of the golden age of Islam and the Muslim history. Um, from a business point of view, Obviously, every business uh, needs a nice, unique name. So we've done that. We've researched. Um, from a business proposition point of view, the initial idea was to conduct direct flights from London to Bangladesh or Silet specifically, where I'm from. And the reason why I wanted to do that is because um, I've seen um, how the flagship operator treats people how they operate, uh, how they behave. And I, want, I wasn't happy with that. And um, I wanted to see if I can make some impact. So that's, that's how we all started off the idea, the initial kind of concept. I didn't think I was going to start when I did. It was supposed to be a way kind of down the line, maybe in 2030, that's when I was supposed to start my ambitions and plans. Then I thought, you know what, I'm still young and, and I've got a bit of time, um, I've got energy. Why not I start researching on the project and what it takes to, to kind of even go down the path of launching an airline? Um, and then that's what I did. I started researching one thing at a um, one thing per day, one thing a day. And I don't know, somehow I found myself into this whole journey, like, you know, where things started becoming serious by itself, because I kept, the more I kept on researching into it, the more I kind of got sucked into it. So that's how it came about. But the initial, I had a lot of cont contemplation and reflection in terms of why I did what I did and why I even wanted to do what I wanted to do. And it all, always came down to the frustration um, of having to, you know, either fly via Middle East or another country to fly to Silet or stick with the flagship operator who don't treat you right and who charge you arm and a leg um, for a ticket in the peak times. Um, and of course, they don't have any respect or whatsoever for, for people's timing. So they will delay uh, as they wish. They will operate as they wish. There, there is no kind of questions asked. And uh, the other option was, um, yeah, you, you fly into the capital city, Dhaka, where nobody wants to go. 
people, majority of the uh, British Bangladeshis um, are from Silet. They want to go straight to Silet. So you can go with the Middle Eastern airline, go to Dhaka and, you know, take another eight hours road trip to Silet. And then from Silet, you might be in another part of Silet, maybe another two hours or something on top of that. So if you were to fly direct, you could get there in about 11 hours. But if you were to fly indirect, that same journey becomes like 27 hours. So I wanted to see if I can make my mark, make an impact and really serve my people. And that was the initial ambition. That's how it all started off. And then, of course, um, later down, down the line, things have evolved and we've pivoted um, due to a number of challenges, which I'm sure you will kind of dig into. My question is, by the sounds of it, it, it all falls on your shoulders for some reason. Why do you feel personally responsible that this is your life goal to, to change for your community? Um, I feel like if I don't, then somebody else won't. So I know how my, the mindset within our community works. There are only a few challengers who are kind of, ter who, who like to challenge things, and there have been a few, maybe with the right intention or maybe not with the right intention, who have tried to set up entities or aviation entities rather. Um, but that's not for me to kind of uh, make a comment on. But I feel like I had to do it. So <laughs> I always uh, look back at my, the, the, the history of my country. The father of nation, Sheikh Mujib, he gave up his life to free the country. So I thought, you know what, maybe take a leaf out of his um, story and free my city from, uh, you know, with, with a better service. Uh, because generally the way it works is, I don't know if there is an internal geopolitics or cultural kind of difference between from district to district within Bangladesh, but I feel like Silet, whilst it's got a lot of money, but it's, it always gets kind of sidelined from, from the actual story of the country. So most of the people don't want to fly into Dhaka, but they are made to fly into Dhaka because that's what, the, I guess, that's, that's how it's been set up. So I feel like if I don't do it, then maybe someone else won't. And honestly, like a lot of people think, oh, it was money motivated and it was, you know, to, to fame motivated. Absolutely not. I am a very shy guy. I've always been a shy guy and I've always been the guy who would just stay behind the closed doors and, you know, try and do something if, if anything. So it wasn't to do with money or fame or anything. All of that came as, I guess, as, as uh, money didn't come for sure. Um, the popularity did come as a result of my efforts. As a byproduct. Yeah, as a byproduct. But that was never the intention. The intention was to serve people and, and to make a change. And it's, I guess it also goes back into my childhood, um, how I grew up. And um, how did you grow up? Maybe uh, tell us a bit of your backstory. I grew up. So I was born in Bangladesh, 1997, not 1986. And the same year, my father migrated to the UK as a, as a um, imam. Um, for those who don't understand what imam is, um, is like a religious minister or a priest um, in a mosque. Um, so he came and then um, majority of us brothers and sisters, there's seven of us, um, we grew up um, without the father being around because he's always kind of living in the UK, working and trying to send money back. We come from a very, very poor background. My father, when he was growing up, he didn't have like, you know, two taka, which is like equivalent of one pence to to even buy his book to study. Oh, wow. Because in, in Bangladesh, you don't really get provided, as, at least if you're studying in Islamic schools, you don't get provided free materials and, and, and stationaries. You have to buy it yourself. He didn't have that kind of money, but he did narrate the stories like his uh, his um, early days and you know his life, and he always said something like he he always pretended that he was speaking English. So I felt like now that I know about all this about, about manifestation and you know all of that stuff, so I think maybe he didn't realize, but it kind of manifested into something 
more tangible and Allah has answered his prayers maybe in a very indirect way. Uh, the community or the area or the village that we grew up in, majority of the people, in fact, he's the only guy who was sent to Islamic school. And people would uh, tell my um, granny, like, you know, why are you doing, like, why are you sending him to Islamic, Islamic school? What's the future? You know, there is no future. You should send him to school, university, and, you know, let him get a proper degree and a job. But things have panned out very differently. So we were the first family from our kind of village, I would say, to, to migrate to the UK in 1997. And just before we arrived, actually, in 1997, my father obviously used to take those internal flights from Dhaka to, to, to Silet. And then I saw once, like, a plane land. So in Silet Airport, you could go upstairs on the rooftop, you pay five taka or something, and you see the plane land. And I saw the plane land, and I was like, wow, like, what is this? That is so cool. Like, you know, you see, like, obviously I couldn't zoom in with my eyes, like, you know, what was happening. I just saw, uh, like, a bird flying with, like, little fla um, lights flashing on its wings. And I saw people were just, like, it's like, it seemed like people were sliding out of a slide. Obviously, now that I know about planes, it, it was staircase that they were coming out of. I was like, why are people sliding out of the plane? But anyway, I went back to my village and I thought, you know what, I need to re recreate <laughs> what I've seen. So in village, I don't know if you know, like, you know, people get those old bearings of, of, uh, of car wheels and they put them into woods and they would make a little cart or something. Oh, no so way. I made my little cart. I would sit on it. It had two wings and I would get someone to push me. And that was my little plane. Um, it's funny because, you know, things that we did like, you know, to, to entertain ourselves, like that was our toy. We made our own toys. But I think that's where kind of things... Um, like I got exposed to a plane and I, I was just taken taken back. Like, what is this? Like, I need to know more about it. And then obviously we migrated to the UK about two years later. And then life happened. You know, you go to school, you get bullied. You know, you forget about everything. You forget about everything that you're, you could be creative. You could be something. You could make something out of your life. That wasn't the case. Obviously, when you go to school, year seven... I didn't get to go to primary school. So I had to start from year seven. I wasn't allowed to go to French, French class. I had to go to a one-to-one -one English class with, with a, a teacher on a one-to-one -one basis. Hated it at that time. But now that I look back, I was like, wow, that was the best thing I think that my school ever done for me. Why with, would you say that? Why was it the best thing? You would have struggled integrating. You, you would have uh, had troubles with the language. Why was that the best thing for you? Because it taught me English and it taught me communication. I started from ABC. So I feel like I can write, I can read, I can write, you know, because of that class. So for three years, I wasn't allowed to go to French class and I think another class. I was, I had to go to a one-to-one -one class and honestly, like, it was daunting. I hated it. I was like doing A, B, C, D, E, F, G and all of that, like, you know, <laughs> as a grown up person. Um, and I remember that teacher, my God, like he was so serious. Like once, every time I didn't turn up to school, he would literally turn up at my door. Like, where is he? No but now that I look back, I was like, wow, this is like, that teacher is like, he's made such an impact. Like, you know, in terms of, I guess it all boils, boils down to communication. If I can't read or uh, write English, then I guess none of this would have happened, whether it's Sunnah Mask or, or Firnas or the progress it made. None of it would have happened. So I went to school um, and then by year 10, I think when I got to year 10, that's when I kind of started kind of being a bit more integrated with the rest of the um, schoolmates. Um, I think that was purely because I started giving Azan on, on Friday prayers. No. Was that at school? Was that at school? Them? At school, Friday prayers, and like the all the bullying stopped completely. Is that because they felt there was a level of respect? Yeah, yeah. I think they felt like, wow, like you know, this guy, like you know, he does that sound. Like, how can we, like you know, now you know, treat him differently? But before that, I was just like one of those guys that you get picked on. Um, Is that because then you struggled previously? Was it the case you weren't maybe popular in school? 
What was the reason? Let's go into the, the depths of it. Generally, I hate it. Even in Bangladesh, I hated school. I don't know what it is. Like, you know, I just didn't like the idea of just sitting in a formal setting and, you know, learning. that. I just don't know. I can't explain it. I don't know why, but I just didn't like school. And I think there are many like me who... Who, who don't like school, but they are very kind of creative with their hands, maybe. They may be good at making things. And I think that's where the difference was. Like, I didn't like to begin with the school. And then, like, I was had to go to school, like, just land in the UK. And a few months later, you're in a whole new environment. You don't know a word of English. I had to go with another guy. Like, my dad, obviously, there was, like, about half an hour, 45 minutes walk from, from where we lived. Um near Christian Street in E1. Um, and that guy, he would only take me up to the gate of the school because he didn't want to see, he didn't want to be seen with another freshie, with a freshie. So he would say, look, you're on your own from here. So you have to find your way. And I was like, oh my God. And I remember like, you know, that time, the first day I arrived in school, my father didn't give me any spending money because he didn't have that much spending money to give, to, to give me for lunch or whatever. It was literally go to school and that is it. And then the teacher said, teacher said, oh, we need to buy you a uniform. I was like, so scared. Like, how, how am I going to pay? Luckily, thankfully, Mr. Mamoon, I think many people know him um, at that time, Stepney Green School. He, he just funded it, my uniform. I was like, oh, God. Save was that day. ahead of year? Was that? He was a head, head teacher. Head teacher. He took us to that uniform school in Benjamin Road nice. and got got the uniform. And I was like, "Yo, how am I gonna pay?" And then um, he paid for it, thankfully. And then he saved my day. Um, but honestly, like lunch money, not was non-existent. Like you, know, you have to take your lunch from home. And again, eating lunch was a problem as well. Like what we grew up eating wasn't like crisps and drinks and you know i would i couldn't go to the tuck shop to buy you know the 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 golden wonders or walkers and and the and and, and coke or, or panda at that time it was yeah do you remember that drink panda panda yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, gold bars so I, I couldn't go to tuck shop so i had to take my own snacks and 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 lunch from home and generally sometimes it would be a boiled egg and can you imagine like you know eating a boiled egg in school, like that is like, you'll get frowned upon. So I would hide in a little corner and just like put the egg in my mouth and just pretend like nothing happened. <laughs> so it was interesting. Uh, and then I started working in, in so from Sabri School, I went to madrasas. My dad took me out of the school to, I, re, I was really intrigued about DT, design and technology. Um, I really wanted to be a car designer. I wanted to know more about how cars are designed and developed. And then I told my dad, like, this is what I wanted to do. And then he was like, nope, that's not happening. You're going to Islamic school. And then I went to Islamic school. And then from there on, like, I just couldn't kind of settle in. I, I just didn't find my place in any of those places. So I kept on changing from subject to subject. So initially, my dad started me off with memorizing the Quran. And I said, look, um, I don't think it's for me. Maybe I can try the Alimiya, which is the Islamic studies, where you become a scholar at the end. Um, I didn't want to do that either. So I had to kind of slowly, slowly, step by step, you know, wiggle out of the situation. Uh, eventually, I managed to do it. And by 2005, I was free. I was free to kind of go and get a job. Um, and I did. My first job was in a basement, in a sh money transfer shop, counting money. Again, like you're fixed into a position and you just have to do the same repeat thing. And uh, it wasn't for me. I said to the guy, look, man, it's not going to work for me. Like, I'm not going to come in anymore. And then I found this job. I was signing up on, on, in job centers. And, and I was like, I came across this job, aircraft cleaner job. I was like, this is it. Like, you know, I'm getting reconnected back to what I was really passionate about. I don't care about what the job is, but at least I'd meet people, I'd, learn, I'd get to learn more about what I was once fascinated about. So I, I went to the job and interview. I was all dressed up in a suit and everything, bearing in mind, this is just you just go into a plane and, you know, clean the seats and pick up the rubbish and, you know, do the bog drops as well. Why did it make you, why did that make you take it seriously? A lot of people I'm would really, just show up. 
I wanted that job so badly, like I, I, I left nothing to chances. I went to Matalan and I bought a suit and everything. I was like, no, nah, I want that job and, you know, I have to get it somehow. And it all started with, you know, with the first impression and, you know, impressing the manager that I was meeting. And he was like, well, you're, you're like a bit overdressed because I saw other people were waiting in the queue as well. And I was like, they were just like dressing like randomly like with the, in a tracksuit and, you know, um, polo shirts and so on. And I was the only guy coming for a cleaner job um, and in a suit and everything. And then obviously, thankfully, I got the job at the end and I started. And I think that's where I got reconnected with aviation. I started thinking a lot about, you know, what this what this all is about. I had colleagues who were like so much senior than me. I was like 21 at that time, I think. And some of the colleagues were like 50, in the 50s, 60s. And they're like, what the hell are you doing here? Like, you know, you're meant to be out learning and ed educating yourself. Like, go and do something. I was like, what am I going to do? Because I'm not interested in anything that's put in front of me. So go, go and learn to have, fly a plane. I was like, how? You can't, like, I can't do that. That's not for me. Like, you know, I'm not even, I don't even have any proper GCSEs. Like, how am I going to do that? He goes, no, look into it, go and learn. Google it and you'll see, you'll be surprised. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. And then I Google and I was like, oh, no, you don't need university degrees. You don't need that many degrees that I guess everyone paints um, to, in a, uh, everyone that associates, you know, with, with, with learning to fly. So I was like, no, oh, wow, like, you know, I can do that too. I took a few flying lessons as well on, on, on the side. And I was like, wow, this is sick. This How is so that? cool. It was so fun. It was so fun because I felt like I'm, I'm, I'm at a place where I really enjoy. So I took a few lessons and then I was like, hang on. Like, one thing everyone keeps saying is like, you need GCSEs. You need GCSEs. Like wherever you go, every flying, that you, flying school that you speak to, they say like, it's good to have a GC, good GCAC. I was like, okay, do you know what? I need to go back to school. And then I went to Keen Student School in, on Valence Road. And then I went for evening classes. So I would work during the day and then I'd go evening class. And then I uh, eventually got a B in English. Again, back to school where, where I learned to speak the first English. And then I went back to KSS to do the GCSE again because I failed pretty much all my GCSEs. I just wasn't interested. And then um, I've got being English and... How does that feel from someone not being able to speak the language to being able to achieve a B, which isn't bad. It's really actually pretty decent. I feel like when I got B in English, I wanted to get B or A or whatever. I, that's when I wanted to. Before that, I was like, it didn't mean anything to me. Now that I knew I needed that particular thing, I needed to get it. And, and it felt good because I was like, wow, like, you know, I'm learning and, you know, I can communicate now all of a sudden because when I first started my city airport job, the cleaning job, like all my colleagues were English and I, I didn't speak a word of English at that no. time. Well, okay, I understood a bit, but I never got used to the idea of speaking about uh, speaking English. And then I, I was forced to speak. I was like, that's what. So 2005 is where I started actually speaking English. So, yeah, it, it, felt, it feels good. And, and I think. Along my journey up until now, English has been like that strength that kind of played into to, to the success so far, being able to communicate, whether it's written or verbal. So it's okay. fantastic. I love the idea that you were one of the founders, co-founders of Sunnah Musk. You were the CEO at the time. How does it feel giving up that mantle piece to your younger brother? What allowed you to let's just say pass on the mantelpiece to your brother like a lot of people wouldn't be able to do that like mm. giving away such notoriety of having a company and so on what made you different i think it was um it came to a point where fernas was taking up a lot of time like a lot of my mental capacity and, and energy and me as a person i don't like being unethical. So I feel like, well, Sunnah Mas is paying my salaries and if I can't give back the same return as I used to, then I need to step aside and let someone else kind of take take forward. 
take the company forward. And at the same time, I also wanted to kind of go down the aviation path, but that's where things became very serious around 2018. Starting from 2016-ish, 2018 became very serious and I felt, look, I need to focus on one thing. Whether it's, going to, it's either going to be Suna Musk or it's going to be Firnas, which one? Obviously, I knew my heart was always telling me like Firnas because I've so, I've kind of got sucked into it so much. I need to make it happen. I need to take it to one kind of at least some sort of success. What was the tipping point? 2018, when 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 we went for all these um, fundraising activities, um, applic um, license application, releasing the aircraft, assembling the team, that took a lot of lot of energy. I just didn't realize how much energy it took because I had the energy at that time. Now that I'm a lot older, and I was like, how did I even even like managing Sunamas at the same time doing all of that on the side? I felt like it was the most right, it was the rightest thing to do, like to hand over to Abid. But I just didn't say, look, here, take it. I said to him, like in 2017, look, I think by next year, you might have to jump in. So maybe like. How did he feel shadowing. about that? Because he was a lot younger. I think he was in his early 20s when he took over Why, the company. Whilst he was a lot younger, but uh, he was also res very responsible and he wasn't a guy who wasn't clued on. He knew. So be, because we started Sunamas at the same time, we were kind of worked together almost on everything. Um, he knew pretty much everything anyway. So it was just a case of like transferring the responsibilities over a year. And then in 2018, I just made that decision. To look, it's going to be in time to let go and maybe let fresh leadership come. And I feel like that was the right decision uh, to make. Even I, still, I stand behind the decision up until now. So I don't have any regrets by saying, you know, uh, Abid should take over. I think he's done an amazing job in terms of taking the company from four, five locations to almost 25 plus now. So it's been a phenomenal journey. And a lot of that growth also happened after the pandemic. So... It was hard. I, I must say, I felt like uh, at one point I felt like I was like, what am I going to do now? It's like, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to, what I normally do. But, and then a lot of things, bad things happened in, in my life in terms of how Fernas turned out from what it was supposed to turn out. I'm sure we'll, we'll dive a bit deeper, you know, how it all came about and where it all ended up. But I think it was a good thing. It was the right thing to do. And he did take Sunomas to, to another, another level, complete another level. And um, yeah, it's been fantastic. There's one person we haven't mentioned, okay? Your wife. So you have a well-paid job. You're getting paid from your own business. It's very well known in the community. Um, it's, the company's growing. But now you, you have... The decision to make, you want to start your own airline. Where does your wife fit in between this? I sometimes blame my wife for it because she's the one who challenged me and said, look, in her own words, I'll call you a man if you do it. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I was like, yo, like, is that how it is now? Yeah, then I need to start. And then I guess to earn that title of being called a man... I started this challenge. Um, I don't know if I'm still a man or not now because um, things definitely hasn't um, turned out the way it has. But I think it, it was her motivation, whether it's Sunna Musk or Fernas, her motivation, her inspiration, her pushing forward has always been there. Even with Sunna Musk days, like she would say, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this in a certain way? Like, why can't you like, you know, take this, you know, why can't you like, you know, grow faster why can't you do this like so she's asking all those questions that triggered triggered certain kind of emotions to take actions so she's always been inspiring as in triggering the emotions that get you to do more would you say that she's a silent partner in a sense i would say so she's uh, she's look at one point i always say say that to her, she was she, she was my sugar mommy like she funded everything. So I didn't, whatever I earned, I put it back into Fernas. I was like, you know, doing, it was come in one way, go out the other way. I wasn't supporting the family in any way, shape or form. So it was her who was working part-time jobs and, you know, just keeping the family kind of moving. How does that feel? On the outside, everyone sees you as 
owning this large fragrance empire, but you're not paying the bills. It's going somewhere else. How does that feel? It's sad. It's sad because I'll tell you a story like just before, just after pandemic, I think, or during the pandemic time. Yes, the world thinks certain things and they see certain things, but they don't see what's actually happened behind the scenes. So I remember my daughter, she was telling me like, Abu, can we go to the shop, sweet shop? I was like, I looked in my pocket, man. And I was like, I, I don't have any money. Like, like that is like, you're part of a big company and, and you don't have money. How does that even make sense? And obviously I was like broke from Fernas. Like, you know, it took every single penny out of me. There was times where, where, where I would literally like just cry to myself. Like, what do I do? What's next? What's next? Like, obviously I would say I was uh, naive as well because uh, I should have planned a lot better in terms of like how things are going to get funded. But you know, with entrepreneurs, there's, there's this, I, I don't know if it's a problem or it's a good thing. Like we always like to just get things going and then solving the problem along the way. And I didn't realize what I was, what a mammoth I was dealing with. It's not launching a fragrance business. It's not, you know, setting up a market stall anymore. This is a serious, seriously regulated business. You can't just like, you know, be however you want. You know, there has to be a system. There has to be processes in place. There has to be certain diplomacy, leadership that is required for you to kind of lead a team of highly experienced, educated, sophisticated men and women. So I just didn't realize what I was actually like putting myself into. I just thought, you know, what? I'll just swim my, so swim my way out of things. I'll just put myself in the deep end and I'll just find a way out. It worked to a certain extent. I would say if certain things didn't go wrong, then I think it would have worked because there was a plan. There was a kind of systematic plan, but the plan was so kind of tight and linked. Everything was linked to one another. If one thing failed, there was no other kind of alternative plan to kind of re kind of regroup and kind of get the plan back on track. And that was, I guess that was a problem. Um, but yeah, it's like, I didn't have money that time and, and I was, I felt so bad to myself. I was like, why? And then I realized, you know what? I think it's my thinking. It's definitely my thinking because I was always like thinking 10 years, everything is 10 years. Everything is just 10 years. If I was to start something today, it's, I'm thinking 10 years. If I'm starting something five months down the line, 10 years from there. So what about my today and tomorrow and the day after? So it's such a basic thing. Like normally people would do that on a day in day out basis. Like they would do it anyway. But for me, I just failed to do it. And I realized, you know what? Things got to change. Like I need to put my also interests first. So every time it came to a situation where I needed something, I would always shy away. Like I didn't want to come across like I'm a greedy guy or something. I don't know why I felt like I, I, I have to be that way, but I just didn't want to come across like, oh, look at this guy, he's so greedy, he just wants everything. Then I realized, you know what, I need to. Now it's not a want, it's a, it's a need. And for the sake of my children, I don't, you know, I want to be able to buy them sweets. And then I made a decision that from that moment onwards, I like, look, I'm going to think about today, I'm going to think about tomorrow, and I'm going to think about what's going to happen like next month and next year. So Yes, I will. I need to have different plans for different kind of stages of, of, of my life. And uh, I sat down and, you know, I budgeted and, and I, I calculated exactly what I needed. And then I just spoke to my brothers and, and I said, look, this is what I need. And, you know, I need to get it. Otherwise, I can't survive. So Alhamdulillah, and that's when Sunnah also started kind of taking, um, started becoming, growing. So up until six store, something was very like t tight cash flow because we never dealt with banks. We never dealt with interest. We never dealt with credit cards, overdrafts, any invoicing uh, facilities from any bank. So we, we, we always did everything on a, on a posit, our own cash flow. But things were very hard. Like, you know, we couldn't like, it, it was, it, it wasn't impossible, but it was so hard. Like it was neck, hand to mouth operation. And then the more we grew, it became more kind of the cash flow loosened up a bit. And that's when we could afford more to pay ourselves more. But that didn't happen until very recently though, like until 2021. So, oh wow. 
I'm, I'm talking about a very recent event and you know now alhamdulillah every time i go past my sh- past the shop if my daughter wants something or my son wants something i'll say yeah let's go how does that feel it feels uh, it feels so good like honestly it just feels so good like the the having the ability to to just you know like provide as you, a man. to provide and and uh, i think fundamentally there was a lot of issues like in terms of i guess my thinking because as i was saying it's a 10 year thing like it can't be a 10 year thing it needs to be today thing as well how am i going to feed myself and my family today and i guess it came to also some resp- take because my wife took away a lot of pressure for me i just fe- i became used to the idea but i forgot the idea that as a man i need to take that leadership role and whether she works or not still provide and then that's the uh, this transition that that was quite difficult but i i just you know dry, dived in i said look from today onwards to my wife you don't need to pay a single thing i'll i'll pay for everything like doesn't what matter what was she doing at the time she would work in sunamas part time okay, and nice. she would like whatever money she would earn she would invest in the family so yeah so we've heard what your brother thought about for nas the but a lot of the older brothers don't really get mentioned in the business sense what was their opinion on for nas I think that they were very passive in in a in a sense like it's not something that appealed to them it's not something that made sense to them and it is something that probably didn't they didn't even agree with would you say they were maybe defensive about you doing it I think they were uh, more worried about me and my well-being um obviously anyone would be uh, and I I think they wanted they didn't want me to suffer and i think it's a indirect form of love maybe um and i think that's why it boiled down to like they didn't want me to go go through the stress or the suffering that i eventually went f- through so your your brothers are very well known in the community a lot of them are imams in local mosques and so on would you say in the sense that it could hurt their reputation if for not seen do well I think there's an element of that as well because and that's not because of me doing it it's because of what happened in the past some people somewhere down the line have done something and then maybe other brothers brothers who are well known in the community got impacted so they were probably thinking oh no maybe this might happen to us Can you go into that a little bit um, more I can't remember which which company was but there is there was a company where the brothers who were also quite prominent figures in the community they kind of got dragged into it as well and and i think quite rightfully they had their kind of concerns. Um, reputations and con- concerns that they need to, needed to manage uh, i would probably do the same thing as well so but yeah i think um yes there was an element of responsibility because um dealing with public investment is 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 not an easy thing and it it's not a fun thing to do as well and and I later realized I actually this is very stressful okay so you have the name for nas what's the next move how do you acquire funding how does that work i looked at every po- avenue possible with the limited knowledge that i had so initially my first point was to identify whether this plan was going to work or not so i called up dft and department of transport and you know asked them hey you know there's this narrative in my community that you can't fly into silet and you know the the bangladesh uh, biman and the authorities will stop you they said no that's nonsense um you can fly if you want to if you got the british license the key word here is british license just like a british passport it's like it gives you accessibility to so much so many parts of the world same way with the british air operator certificate or operating license you get some golden accessibilities since the flying boat days or something you know they have all these i guess it's it's coming from the colonial past like they've got all these historical agreements with various countries and various ports where they can do trade and business and those have stayed and it's that same bilateral or air service agreement that bangladesh biman um, operates under to fly into silet or london uh, to fly into london from silet 
so bilateral is like it's like a two-way thing right so same way a british operator can do the same thing so there's about seven frequencies no 14 frequencies available straight into Sile from london per week that's a double daily flight and that's in accordance with the what dft is saying now this is not me saying that's what the letter said and and I thought, you know what, that means there is a case, uh, what people are saying, what the understanding the community is wrong. So let's dive a little bit deeper. I started emailing other CEOs of other airlines. I say, hey, you know, I want to do this. You know, we should sit down. We should talk. I was like, I was like they, were, they were probably thinking, like, who the hell is this guy? Who does he think he is? And then at that time, there was a guy by the name of Kevin Steele. He was, he literally just left Biman, Bangladesh Airline. He was the CEO. And I said, look, What's, this, what's the story, man? Like, you know, is that true that you guys, like, the Biman can stop a f operator? I said, they, he said, no. If you have the license today, you can fly there tomorrow. Like, that is, it's as clear as that. And then I thought, okay, well, Kevin, you need to come on board as well then. <laughs> and then... Um, How did you get in touch? Was it just an email was, he responded? You know what? What? LinkedIn is such a powerful tool. Like, LinkedIn, Google, those, like platforms have been like a game changer for me and and i'll tell you a little bit about you know how linkedin also helped me put the noise the information out there about finance so i connected with so many people it was either emailing them directly through to the company ceo email or emailing them through linkedin which goes directly into their personal inbox so I connected with various people to find out initially that what it takes. Kevin said, look, you need about at least 10 million to oh, wow. begin with. Like, you know, if you really want to get this going, which then became 100 million. I'm like, yo, like. Is that disheartening hearing that number? Yes. Like I went to trade shows where they sell aircraft seats and entertainment systems and this and that. I was like, so I would every, every time I would go to the shows and, and because I was so emotionally invested, I, was, I would go back to the hotel. I was like, this is not going to happen, is it? Like if the flipping seat is going to cost me like uh, $5,000 uh, per unit economy seats, then what about the rest? So every time, every, everywhere you looked, there was just money, 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 money. It's like it is not a cheap business at all. And then... Um, when it came to when when I when we realized like actually it's not even ten million anymore it's about hundred million we met with the CAA the the authorities here and then they said look I will we will make sure that you don't get the license if you don't have certain things cer certain ducks in a row we're like yo like this is serious like no we can't these guys are very serious like they're not messing about he was the first investor that believed in your dream. I can't mention any names, but um, there are a few very close well wishes. And I think those people, they didn't really invest in the plan. They invested in me as a person. Like they thought, you know what? If he's able to do this with SM, Sunnah Mas, like you know, from nothing, 600 pound startup capital to what it, where it, what it was at that time, then I'm sure with that same determination and discipline, he might just do it. So I think on that basis, people kind of put the money in, in, into me as a person, as opposed to the plan. Maybe they didn't even believe in the plan, but they just thought maybe just in case. And, and they, they supported me. And, and with those people, I will never, ever kind of forget, you know, their, their belief in me when I, needed the when I needed it the most. Does that add extra pressure knowing that it's close friends and families putting this money in? 100%, 100%. Not just like close family and friends, anyone, any, any, if it was an entity that does it for a business, like they invest money into other projects, that is their business. They've got pool of funds to play with and some of them will go to loss and some of them will work. And the ones that will work will make, make up the loss. But these people like, it's the hard earned money. So it's so much pressure. It applies so much pressure. You have to kind of, you're always thinking like, you can't let these people down like forget letting yourself down like that you can manage but all those ambitions and dreams and belief in you like you can't let them down and this is not just 
here in the UK is all around the world since the documentary got released in 2018. Uh, there was a global kind of uh, knowledge of, of Firnas, like people from Australia knew about it, from USA knew about it, Malaysia, Indonesia, Bangladesh, like it was all over the media. And that created so much more pressure as well to deliver, to try and deliver. So it is super, super hard um, to, you know, just think of a scenario where you might have to let people down. It's, it's hard. You've mentioned that Finas is becoming very prominent and you could say it's even overshadowing Sunamas a little bit. Do you feel like there's an ego at play when you, you feel as though you have your own thing going on, that Finas is yours? It's all on your shoulders. How does that feel? I think, you know what it is? Ego, like, I don't know if ego, if I gained ego along the way. Maybe I have, maybe I haven't. But one thing I knew for sure, it was the responsibility and it was the idea of having to deliver on, 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 the, on the project. And whether I liked it or not, it came on my shoulders and I needed to deliver. That was the main thing. It wasn't... Maybe since the when the Channel 4 documentary got released, maybe like, you know... And I think maybe that was a problem as well for me because what Channel 4 documentary did, it kind of... It was like a CCTV on me all the time. Like, what am I doing? Every move that I was making, it, it kept me in check. So after the documentary came, everyone was like, wow, 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 like, you know, amazing, amazing, congratulations. But they shouldn't... Like, I shouldn't really hear those words because... When I heard people say, no, you can't do it, that's when I worked harder, extra hard to make things happen. So Channel 4 documentary was a good thing in a way, but I think it was also a bad thing for me as an individual from a growth perspective, because it made you, you heard that word like that, that positive kind of message so many times, then you become kind of, maybe you kind of, your brain starts, you believing know, in, believing in it. So I think maybe that was a bad thing and maybe it shouldn't have, but... The PR that it generated, it was, I would say, people, even if people paid money for it, I don't think they would, they would get that kind of PR. 47 minutes on national TV, cup backed with mainstream newspaper articles purely on one story. It was amazing. But um, I, don't think you, I, I don't think I ever got ego um, in that sense, like, you know, where you're, you know, I've got my own thing and, you know, I'm, a, I'm my own man now. It was ra rather, it was scary because I was so used to, like, working with my brothers we always kind of had each other's back and then all of a sudden like you're on your own now and do you feel like you had the support of your brothers i think i don't know but some of them visibly could see there was support and some of them maybe deep down they were probably praying for me but in the front they didn't want to encourage me to go ahead maybe they did like i said before they didn't want me to kind of get hurt along the way Okay. There's a very well-known figure in your Channel 4 documentary. Um, so there was Abdul. How did you meet Abdul? <laughs> Abdul. I miss him. That's, let me start with by saying I miss him because we had, a very, we had amazing times together. Uh, we traveled together. We've been to places. He was such a funny guy. Always give, he gave you a laugh. Even if you were going through a hard time, he somehow kind of made it look, you know, okay and fun. Having said that, um, I met him on an online forum, aviation forum. So obviously I needed to get the word out there. So I kept on, I went all the, to all these forums and I spoke about what I wanted to do. And instantly people realized, who's this new kid on the block? Like, you know, who is this guy? Let's go and find out what, this, what he's about. Abdul, on the other hand, he emailed me saying, look, um, if you need any advice, support, on learning more about aircraft lease and rates and you know how this all works then let me know and had he we, already known of cinemas or no nah, i don't think he knew like who i was and i didn't know who he was i didn't even know like none of us neither of us knew that we ex either of us existed because he was from another part of london but we never kind of cross cross paths and it was this aviation thing that brought us together we got we whatsapped each other a number of months before we eventually met up. And the first meeting I think was when we went to a meeting in Stansted Airport. 
like for the first meeting was going to a meeting so nothing even prior to that let's no, say no, a no, coffee no, a couple of no, coffee no 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 and then things became serious like it was initially like i took them with me so they can like like we looked significant and you know we had a team and um also it was kind of nice to have a couple of other people with you yeah, you didn't feel feel alone do you think he was qualified you've just met him off a forum is he the person to be taking to this big meeting um i don't know like maybe M- maybe not i don't know um but at that time it was the right thing to do at that time i needed to do it and that was i guess what i did um looking back if i was to do it everything from today onwards if i was to, then of course things will be very different it what would you different. have done differently i would have probably taken a lot more time to plan a lot more time to budget things across um and not start with with a big 100 million pound ambition or a dream maybe start off small maybe maybe become a travel agent maybe get you get to know the industry build a customer base build your because the bottom line is ultimately it's the customer that you want to serve right so i'll probably start off as a travel agent build my customer base crm the flow like you know build my community of customers and as soon as you've got the platform to kind of fly them with then things become a lot easier and that way you get a lot of data as well in terms of trends you know where people are going what seasonalities what they're paying and stuff like that so i would probably say i would start off with champion the championing the customers first and then slowly slowly eventually bring the aviation in as a kind of byproduct as a as part of a supply chain management where you kind of control the whole supply chain do you feel like you were dreaming too big where you're forgetting the basics so you... i think so i think like i went on the i, I went to the end before going to the beginning the stepping stones yeah, of yeah. gradually growing like i said if i was to do it all over again if I, if he were if he had to be serving bangladesh or pakistan or india for that matter i would start off on the ground re- level ground like just getting to know the customers because these are the people that you would eventually need and then if you kind of champion them and if you kind of got them together and make yourself familiar and offer a good service where, even as a travel agent then then you have a community to work with uh in terms of customer base because airline business is is very cutthroat like if, from a customer point of view as well we always go for the cheapest option on skyscanner so sometimes we would even consider like stopping over at a destination just so we can get that cheaper price so it is very a price driven kind of business so i think i would start at the lowest level possible just to kind of get myself in the kind of uh, i would say i would put revenue first as well like i would not invest so thousands and thousands and thousands thousands of pounds before making any money i would want to see like is this viable can i make money from day one if so then it's a good start and maybe later down down the line you probably wouldn't even want to do do the aviation business maybe it might come across to you like actually no maybe it's not the because for the effort that you put in the results are wise so like risky it, it can go up very fast if if a, an airline works then it can go up super quick like you could be global like within within years because your effect it's like i i say it's like running a country like because you're dealing with country it's like you're a prime minister of a country being running an airline because you're dealing with countries you're dealing with different authorities different you know geographies so that's the funnest part like the complexity that's involved so it can go up very quickly but when it goes down may you have no time to think or re-strategize how am i going to how am i going to you know recover the situation because by then it's too late because only because you're operating a schedule and whether you're flying or not flying you're still like facing so if you're operating a schedule you have to fly like whether you like it or not you can't if you don't fly then the customers will lose trust in you because you have canceled the flights so even if you have a 25% loaded plane 
then you still have to fly but from your bottom, for your bottom line you're losing like you're bleeding money out of your ears can you go into the specifics on numbers or i think for 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 an airline or for an airline to be successful or even keep it kind of like keep everything level you need at least about on average about 80 80% load factor throughout and this is not just going one way it's going back load factor as well so can you imagine like it's the last 10% 15% 20% that will make all the it will determine whether you make money or not are anything below you're like kind of eating into your cash flow and and things are looking bad so i have so much appreciation for the likes of emirates and and all these big mega 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 company even ryanair like my god like it is so fascinating like how this stuff works it's like so stretched operation and 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 you can lose money so fast and that's the scariest part so i have so much respect for the ceos of like other airlines who are profitable because that takes skills and 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 really some some serious leadership to to make profit do you feel like the documentary represented you well did they have their narrative to fit or was it the case they're actually creating a documentary following your life i i think 60% of it is is kind of somehow readjusted to fit a certain storyline because end of the day it's a film channel 4 invested in the film i don't know i think from what i remember i think it was 250k or something mm-hmm. into the project because the crew had to fly into various countries including bangladesh so it took it, it involved a lot of costs um but i think i let myself kind of into it as well because i didn't know how media worked at that time until right at the end when i was ah oh, now i know like what what these questions mean so every time i was asked a question from their part it was a well researched question that will get a certain answer and they know what the answer would be and they wanted that on the camera but i didn't know that that i thought it was just like me and you were talking like a freestyle kind of conversation it wasn't a freestyle conversation in the documentary it was all kind of pre-planned questions and and i think that's what i failed to realize and that's where you see politicians you know how they answer questions they never answer a question they pivot they pivot and they go back to their own narrative so that's what i kind of uh, failed to realize in that process but i think it's good that i didn't realize it because, and because that gave natural that natural of kind of um insight into who i was and and maybe i wouldn't take them to some places like my where old warehouse that didn't reflect very well on the airline side of things because airline is supposed to be perceived to be a very polished very sleek industry and then associating your <laughs> old garage type arch warehouse then you're trying to do this it just didn't kind of add up but it it was what it was and i, I, I my view was look it is a documentary and 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 i'm happy to be who i am i'm not going to try and fake someone that I'm not so that was my view but maybe if I was to do it all over again I would take a lot more kind of leadership approach into the whole documentary whether whether it was leading the team as well like I would probably take a much much stronger leadership approach into the how I manage the team because at that time I was just relying on the experts you know experts could experts had to tell me what to do and I just had to go with the experts because I gave too much importance to the experts but the experts can also be wrong and a lot of the times they have been wrong and how does that make you feel your ceo co-founder of a large company an entrepreneur you're now giving away that responsibility to people in your team it's very scary because at the end the experts could be gone but you're still here your commitment still stays with your suppliers and stakeholders and with and investors or, and lenders so it's scary but at that time you think it's either losing those people or taking into account what they're saying and just doing it but now that I look back I'll probably just take a much much more kind of diplomatic approach to get the getting them to my kind of understanding not understanding in a sense like when it came to technical knowledge but onto the strategies 
But I would have probably expected some of the experts to also tell me, look, um, okay, we understand that you want to do this, but why don't you start on the level zero so you can get to this ultimately? Do you think they took advantage? I think so. I think so. You this know, sometimes I feel like I, I, I need to sue some of them because they should have really, really, because I entrusted them to teach and educate me. And all they were probably concerned about was the invoice. And that's what was disheartening. But I don't like to burn bridges. I don't like to, you know, have bad relationships. Even if I was wronged, um, I would still probably just say, you know what? I learned and I won't do it again. Our community could be, say, quite judgmental on, on certain things. Do you think the documentary was well received? I think from our community point of view, like whether it was bad or good, the fact that it was on Channel 4 and the fact that I was like praying in my documentary doing wudu and I was just being who I was. And I think from Muslim community as a whole, they really appreciated the fact that there was some form of authenticity and re yeah, representation in that sense. So, yeah, from, but I think it wasn't received well from many other communities. So, what do you and, mean I, by and that? I understand their feeling because I, if I was probably another community and if someone else came and done something, maybe I would probably have some kind of like stereotypes. I don't know. So I don't blame the people that didn't receive it well because they're not used to it. Okay. <laughs> At what point did you, did you think this isn't going to work? Like, I've put in too much money, I, I need to cut it off. At what point did that happen? It was such a hard, it was, it was a very hard thing to do. Like, I knew it was coming at some point, uh, just before pandemic, when we had a leased aircraft that was used for license. And I had a meeting with the CAA um, in Gatwick. And they said, look, if it's going to be this aircraft involved, we know this aircraft well, we know the owner very well, and we know how it was maintained, and it's not going to happen. So whether you find, maybe you can find another aircraft to apply your license with, or you kind of withdraw your license, we'll return your money and you can revisit it another time. That's when I knew like, we're in shits, like it's bad. When the CAA, the, the, the flight operations, the inspector that was assigned, when he says like, ain't happening, alarm bells gone off into the CAA building and they're like, nah. And then I came back, I was like, so sad, so sad. Explain those emotions. I was sad. I was broken. I was really broken because so much hope, so much dream, so much. It was, it's about to get shattered. I went back to the aircraft owner. I said, look, what's going on, man? Like, you should have at least told me, you know, like you didn't tell me that aircraft needed 500K worth of modifications. No, it was flyable. It was good. But to get up to the modern uh, instruments and, and all of that, you need to spend more money to modify it because it's a old, very old aircraft. So I knew that at, that at that point, I didn't want to accept it because I just wasn't ready to accept it. But I knew like it's going down. Do you feel like you should have taken some personal accountability for that? You I should do, have known I, that you should have uh, done your due diligence. I, 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 I do. I take full accountability because... And at the end of the day, if I didn't make certain decisions, then we wouldn't have gone down that route of aircraft. But at that time, again, that was the only choice that I had to kind of make progress. Uh, maybe at that time, I should have just said, you know what, we need to stop. Like, we need to reevaluate. But it's, it's a very, ch we'll talk in another um, podcast, but it's a very chicken and egg situation. It's like everything is just linked to one another. Unless you have 100 million to play with, like you just throw money and the problems get solved. So, yeah, 2018, just before lockdown, I think it was coming down and lockdown came and just done a, it was icing on the cake for everything to kind of just come to an end. And then that's, that's when I had to tell the investors, look, everything's going to a standstill. Like it's nothing's going to happen anymore until we kind of reevaluate. Who was the first person you, you told and what was the conversation like? I told all the, all the investors, I sent an email saying, look, uh, until further notice, uh, because it's pandemic, nothing's, the world's not moving. So as such, we're also kind of going to stop any form of expenses and, and, and any, any kind of uh, activities. 
but i guess we'll speak another time in terms of like you know how it all went down from there on and and where it's now and what's happening now